Welcome to the Rockbrook Church Podcast. Our hope is that today's message brings you hope and clarity for your spiritual journey. We love hearing how God is working in your life. Feel free to share any stories of how this message gave you a new perspective and hope. Email us at church at rockbrook.org to tell your story. Well, I love Mother's Day because I enjoy honoring my wife and my mother and my mother-in-law and all the great mothers in our church. I saw this picture of a mom at a baseball game uh, grabbing down a foul ball while holding on to a baby. I thought I never saw Alex Gordon do that. Come on, sheesh. No one paying her $50 million, right? No shade on Gordo. Welcome here at Rockbrook anytime. I also love... um, I also love Mother's Day because summer is on the way and our summer small group semester is coming up and uh, this is a great, great opportunity to get connected, stay connected uh, throughout the summer. Uh, At Rockbrook, we don't take summer off of our faith or off of growing or off of connecting in any way and so many of our summer groups are uh, learning what the Bible has to say about serving as we gear up for Serve Day in July and you can preview our list of summer groups at rockbrook.org slash connect or in the app. And I just encourage you, we give this encouragement from time to time. I know summer can be busy, might be traveling or uh, different things happening. Uh, but just stay connected as much as you can. You know, there's no, uh, no, no problem with signing up for a group. And uh, if you can only make it a few times or just serve day or whatever, that's fine. Uh, just stay connected as much as you can. Lean into God. Put him first this summer. Same thing with the weekend. Uh, plug in uh, as much as you're able just because you're going to miss one or two. Don't miss, the, don't miss out on the whole thing. And let's continue growing in our faith uh, this summer. I'm looking forward to uh, my small group this summer starting up in June. So we've got some of the groups out there and uh, you can lean in to begin being connected this summer at Rockbrook. A little boy had gone to kindergarten for half days throughout the year. So when he started first grade, after lunch, he started packing up to go home. And the teacher informed him that, honey, in first grade, you get to go to school all day. And the little boy exclaimed, well, who signed me up for this? (laughs) And when he finally got home, he expressed his frustration to his mother. And she said, honey, are you overwhelmed? And he said, yes, I have too many whelms, much too many whelms. I want to ask you, do you have too many whelms? Are you overwhelmed, overbooked, overspent, overloaded, overworked, overcrowded? As a result, you may feel overstressed or overanxious or overwhelmed. Today, I want to look at the subject of moving from being overwhelmed to overflowing, from overwhelmed to overflowing. And friend, I really believe this message could impact your life. This is not just another sermon in the slot in this sermon series. Uh, I believe if you'll really hear this today and if you'll apply it, that it can make a significant impact in your season of life right now, in this day, in these weeks, in these months, in whatever you're going through. And so I want to begin today as we continue this series by explaining that there's two different, fundamentally different approaches to life. You can approach life with a shortage mindset or you can approach life with a surplus mindset. You might see those two on your outline if you're following along. And there's a big, big difference between the two. A shortage mindset, if you might write this down, means that I never have enough and I never will. I never will have enough. And that's going to leave you feeling overwhelmed. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough energy. I don't have enough contacts. I don't have enough opportunities. I don't have enough knowledge. I don't have enough education. I don't have enough whatever. And that causes you to feel overwhelmed by life. Now, in the Bible, you're going to see words like, I'm lacking, or I'm wanting, or I'm in need. That there is not enough. I'm just always in competition. I'm always overwhelmed by what's happening in life. Now the focus when you're living in a shortage mindset is the focus is on my limited resources. I just don't have enough resources. I don't have enough going on. I don't have enough to make it connect and to make it happen. 
and you look at all the things that you're lacking. And the result is an overwhelmed life. Just always behind, never have enough. And when you have a shortage lifestyle, you begin to think that life is like a big piece of pie. And if somebody else takes a larger piece, then that means less for you. Someone else gets promoted, oh, there's no uh, direction uh, for me. Someone else gets more, you begin to be resentful or you get worried or you get anxious because there's not enough of the pie to go around for everybody. And that's a shortage mentality. And it leads to envy, it leads to jealousy, it leads to resentment, leads to worry, dissatisfaction, insecurity. Because there's not enough for me. And you're focused on your limited resources. Now instead, God calls us to live another kind of lifestyle, which is a surplus mentality. And the surplus mentality is this. God has more than I'll ever need. And he'll never run out. Now notice what this does not say. This does not say that I have more than I need or you have more than you need. That would be a self-help message. That would be me just trying to give you some optimism and kind of prop you up and give you a good halftime speech to go back out in the world of, no, honey, you really have enough. You'll be fine. You have more than you. No, no, no. The focus is God has. The truth is I do have limited resources. The truth is I don't have enough. But God has more than I'll ever need. I think of Elisha uh, when he told his assistant to go feed the people. And Elisha said, there is not enough. There is not enough food. And Elisha told him, uh, start feeding them anyway. And miraculously, there was enough. Now Jesus took that miracle to the exponential power when he fed uh, 4,000 men and their families and then fed 5,000 men and their families Jesus is giving us example after example that God doesn't give us one pie, he's a pie factory. And there will always be more pies because he'll keep creating them. And in the Bible you see words related to God's storehouse of abundance, abounding, and plentiful. God has more than enough to meet all your needs. And everybody else's needs at the same time. Let me give you an example. How often do you find yourself worrying that the person breathing next to you is stealing all of your air? (laughs) How often do you go to bed at night and think, these people in the house are going to suck up all of my air and there's not enough for me? No, of course not, because God has created a process. I don't understand it. People have tried to explain it to me, but he's created a process where there is more than enough air for every person and that you have all you need and everybody else can have all they need as well. I'll give you another example. If you have a candle burning at night and you light someone else's candle, is yours now dimmer? No, the room is now in fact brighter. Now the result or the focus of a surplus mindset is instead of focusing on my limited resources, I am focusing on God, on God's limited resources. And the result of that is an overflowing life. When I'm not focused on myself, when I'm not self-centered, but when I'm God-centered and when God is at the center of my life. Now there's a phrase in Psalm 23 where David wrote uh, this three, three words from Psalm 23. Let's say them out loud together. My cup overflows. My cup overflows. Maybe you've heard this say, uh, said as my cup runneth over. What's he talking about here? He's talking about the overflowing life rather than the overwhelmed life. He's talking about a surplus mindset rather than a shortage mindset. In Psalm 23, you see a progression. He says, God gives me everything I need. And then later he says, God gives me more than I need. And then he gets to a place where my cup runneth over. My cup overflows. Now, what is your cup? The metaphor here, you might write this down, is my cup is my life. My life. When David says my cup overflows, he's saying my life is overflowing. He's saying I'm not overwhelmed anymore because uh, I don't have enough time or energy or whatever. I'm not overwhelmed because my resources are limited. There's a river coming out of me. There is more than enough. My cup overflows. Jesus talked about this 2,000 years later. We find it in the Gospel of John chapter 7. 
Now the context is here is that Jesus is at a feast or a festival in Jerusalem. And it's called the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles. And it's one of three feasts that uh, all the Israelites were requ- required to travel to Jerusalem to celebrate. And it lasted for eight days. We lose in the screen here. I'm, that's flashing. I'm just going to shut it off for, uh, so it's not flashing the whole service there. So he, you go, you'd have to travel if you were in a certain vicinity of Jerusalem. You'd have to travel there for three feasts each year. This Feast of Tabernacles would last for eight days. And during the feast, there was a lot of symbolism of what they were celebrating. Because they were celebrating when Jesus, or when God, led them through the promised land. And as we studied before, they would set up the tabernacle and worship at the tabernacle, take down the tabernacle, move it. All the Israelites were in their encampments and they were sleeping in tents. So actually people would move out of their houses for eight days during the Feast of Tabernacles and live in tents as a reminder of Jesus or God bringing them through that. But all of it's pointing to Jesus. And during this feast, the temple area was illuminated by some large candlesticks and they were reminders of the pillars of fire uh, and that led the people of Israel. There would be uh, trumpets blown at the temple reminding people of the greatness of the glory of God. But also during this feast of tabernacles, water each day would be brought up from the pool of Siloam to be poured on the altar in front of the temple. And it was a reminder of the water that flowed from the rock in the desert to miraculously supply the needs of the Israelites during the Exodus. And so in John chapter 7, you see Jesus and his disciples at the Feast of Tabernacles and several different things happening, several different teachings that he makes. And he's teaching that the water that poured out to quench the thirst really represented, what it really represented is The journey through the wilderness, yes, but it's looking forward to a promised kingdom and a promised Messiah. And so we'll go all the way to verse 37 that says, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, and some translations translate this, that he shouted out to the crowd. There's probably 50,000 people on the last day of the festival outside the temple there when the water is brought up to be poured on the altar. 50,000. So just imagine this scene. Imagine the drama. Jesus Christ stands up. He shouts at all the people. And this is what he shouts out. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And then John adds on, he's writing this much, much later, and he adds on commentary to what Jesus is talking about. He says, by this, he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So what's he talking about here? He's talking about the same thing David's talking about, my cup overflows, that God is the source of my life. And he says, anybody who believes in me, who really believes in me, will have rivers of living water flowing out of their lives, living an overflowing life. Now, where he says at the beginning of verse 38, in fact, Jamie, let's go up one slide and look at that. When he says, whoever believes in me, that that word in the Greek is the word pastuo for belief, pastuo, and it means more than just having a knowledge about like uh, more than just knowing Jesus as the son of God or when he lived or some data about him. It means to trust in, it means to cling to, means to rely on, to depend on. And he says, if you really depend on me, uh, your life is not going to be overwhelmed. You're going to have a river of living water flowing out of you. Well, you say, okay, well, fine. What is an overflowing life? Let me give you a definition, write this down, that an overflowing life is to be filled beyond capacity with an endless supply of God's goodness. 
And friend, that's what I want for you. That's what we want for you. That's what this church wants for you. To be filled beyond capacity, overflowing with the goodness of God. That's what an overflowing life is all about. To continue on in Psalm 23, it says, Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now this illustration, this metaphor that the, of this cup in your life, my cup overflows, the Bible uses it all throughout Scripture. And it talks about having a cup of joy, having a cup of blessing, having a cup of hope, the cup of salvation, on and on that God wants your life to overflow with joy, hope, blessing, salvation. Why? Because God is good. That's why. Friend, anytime you doubt the goodness of God, it's just going to lead to more trouble in your life. You're just going to compound worry and you're going to compound the problems in your life. This is why God says in love, he says, as your creator, I want you to trust my good plan for you, my good instructions, my good principles, my good way. And if you trust his principle, if you trust his principles for every part of your life, for your body, for your money, for your energy, for your reputation, everything you have, if you trust his goodness, it will not compound the problems, it will not lead you to be overwhelmed, you'll be overflowing. But listen to this. Anytime I disobey God, so God says, here's the principle, here's the way, walk in it, and I say, no, I'm going to do it this way. At that moment, what I'm doing is I'm doubting the goodness of God. That's the fundamental problem. Anytime God says, here's the way, and I take my own way, I'm saying, well, I think I know what's good for me more than you do, and I think that I am, I'm more good then you are. And at that point, I'm doubting the goodness of God. And any time that you doubt the goodness of God, you're making a fatal mistake. Because God knows what's going to satisfy you, what's going to quench your thirst ultimately, more than you do, more than I do. When I think I know what's going to make myself happy, and I'm doing something different than the way God says to do it, I end up, I inevitably end up more overwhelmed. Now, I want to be very clear. It's not that when I take my own way, it's not that when I doubt God's goodness, that it changes his love for me. No, the problem is that when I doubt God's goodness, it changes my love for him. And he says, look, I'm the parent who loves you. I'm the heavenly father who loves you. And I'm coaching you in a way. I'm guiding you in a way. And anytime I disobey him. I'm saying, God, I just really don't trust that your way is good for me. And I think what's good for me is more important than what you think is good for me. And that, but when I continue to believe in him, continue to trust in him, continue to trust his way and walk in it, that's pastuo. That is pastuo belief, continuing to cling to, rely on, depend on, trust in him. In Colossians chapter 2, Paul instructs us that so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, so just as you pastuo, just as you really believed in him and you received him and you received salvation, continue to trust in him that way. Continue to believe in him that way. Continue to live your lives in him. Rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. So just as you had a faith that came to him that said, I need a savior, you come to him and say, God, I still need you today. And I need you to guide me and lead me and I need to trust in your goodness for my life. And you keep trusting him that way and you will overflow. You will overflow with thankfulness. It's that great for you. And you'll know it's God's strength that's getting me through this. So how do you go from that place, from overwhelmed to overflowing in life? Well, there are many, many ways. Uh, There are many, many points and habits and different things I could have given you today that will help. In fact, today at step two of the growth track, we're going to teach some essential habits for overflowing living uh, that will help you walk in the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, and live an overflowing life. So in today's message, in today's sermon, 
uh, instead of giving you more habits or more keys, I want to give you one key attitude that's at the root of all of it. That if you will adopt this attitude, Fred, I believe it will change, it, it will change your life. It's that pivotal. To go from overwhelmed to overflowing, what's one key attitude that I need to have for that to happen? You have to, to go from overwhelmed to overflowing, you have to stop griping, stop grumbling, and start being grateful. It's gratitude. Overflowing with thankfulness, as that Colossians verse said. Now, before we get to more Bible verses, did you know that science has proven this true hundreds of times over? That, that this attitude, actually, that this attitude impacts your physical health. That complaining is very, very unhealthy emotion for you. That griping is unhealthy physically, mentally, in every way. But gratitude, study after study, has shown it is the healthiest emotion for your mind and for your body. If you want to be healthy, learn gratitude. When you are grateful, it changes the makeup, the outlook of your brain. When you are thankful, it produces things in your brain that you need going through your brain. And so you ought to get up in the morning and before you talk to anyone else, say something that you're grateful for. Find something, this is in one of our prayer guides in the Pray First book of like, think of something that you've never, maybe you've never thanked God for, you get up and say, God, thank you that she did not breathe all the air and there's more than enough for us and I'm just gonna start with gratitude today. And you just start and watch what it does. Even, even trying to think of things to be grateful for affects the mind positively. The Bible says, in everything that you do, stay away from complaining and from arguing. Why is that? It's because it's the exact opposite attitude of gratitude. Let, let me ask you this question. When you complain about something, how's that working for you? Like, when you complain about the weather, does that change the weather? <laughs> when you complain about the way you look, does that change the way you look? When you complain about your spouse or your children or situation or anything else, does that change your spouse or your children or your situation? And you might say, well, it feels good to vent. Well, crack cocaine feels good too, but it ain't good for you. <laughs> Not that I would know, by the way. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 5.18, read this out loud with me. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. What is God's will for us? People ask me as a pastor what God's will for their life is. And you remember that message, I preached five things from the Bible that we absolutely know God's will is for us, and here's one of them. Martin Luther referred to gratitude as the basic Christian attitude. He said he considered it the heart of the gospel. Now, here it says, give thanks in all circumstances. That does not say give thanks for all circumstances. That would be ridiculous to give thanks for cancer, to give thanks for a fire in your house, to give thanks for um, a division in your home, to give thanks for a health problem? No. It says give thanks in all circumstances. Uh, when I read that verse, I remember last summer I was walking uh, in a park on like a pathway on a trail in a park. And I walked by this guy who's working and he's digging a hole right next to the trail. And I don't know what the hole is for. I walked by and I, it was a hot day in the summer. Sun shining, one of the hotter days. And I said, man, it's a hot day for that. And he looks up to me and snaps back and says, yeah, it's a hot day to not have a job too. Like, you know, like, <laughs> I thought that's give thanks in all circumstances, right? He's not giving thanks for digging a hole. He's not giving thanks for a hot day, but he's giving thanks in digging a hole in a hot day. And that's the difference. And I suggest that you start every day with the, what Martin Luther called the basic Christian attitude. 
that you start each day with the heart of the gospel. And you start each day uh, with gratitude for God, what God has done for you, and for others. And you just begin your day that way. In fact, this is the homework. This is the action step. Anyone, anyone at Rockbrook who hears this message this weekend, here's the action step. For the next week, for the next week, until you come to church again next Sunday morning, each morning, have the first thing you do, the first communication you make in your day, be to someone that you're thankful, something you're thankful for, that you're thankful for them. So your day begins, you type up an email to someone, you say, I'm just grateful for you, thankful for you, thankful for this. You send a text message, you make a phone call, you go into work, the first thing that you do. I'm not saying that the first, inter- the first thing you do in every interaction all day is gratitude. That'd be good too, but I'm saying, I hope I'm making this clear, that your first thing that's out of your mouth or the first communication you make in the day is gratitude. And watch how it impacts your day. Watch how it makes your, you healthier. The Bible is so serious about this attitude. God commanded it. God commands it. I'll just close with a few more verses. I showed you this one of overflowing with gratitude from Colossians 2. I just found it fascinating reading through Colossians this week that in each and every chapter of Colossians, Paul brings up a command to give thanks. Chapter 3, verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace. I love that he just adds this sentence. There's no poetry about it. There's nothing. And be thankful. (laughs) Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Colossians 4.2 So that was Colossians 3. We go to Colossians 4. Devote yourselves to prayer. Be watchful and thankful. And he keeps dropping this in. That yes, are we to be watchful? Yes, are we to test every spirit? Yes, are we to admonish one another? Yes, are we to grow? Yes, are we to have our guard on and and have uh, the armor of God on? Yes. And all the while, we are to be thankful. We are to be grateful. Backing up to Colossians chapter 1, we also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power so that you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy, always always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. And friend, if you are racking your brain for something to be thankful for today, here it is right here. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Which, yes, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. So we are gonna spend just a few minutes in prayer today. I don't know when the last time you've done this is that you've just sat still. Your mind, your heart, even your posture, just open before God to receive from him rivers of living water, overflow, that he is your source, that he is all you need, and to thank him. Would you do that with me now? Well, Heavenly Father, we confess to you that absolutely we will never have enough. It's true. We're lacking, we're wanting, we're in need, and we have limited resources. But God, you don't call our focus to be there. Uh, You call us to live a God-centered life, focused on more than we'll ever need. And God, we want to be able to say like David, uh, my cup overflows, my life overflows with rivers of living water, God, we're thankful for your spirit. We thank you that you fill us. And God, we invite you to fill us again today. God, we want to lean into your goodness. God, just as we 
uh, come to you in belief, that pastuo belief of really trusting in you for our salvation, clinging to you, turning to you, repenting to you. Uh, we do that yet again today. And we want to be rooted and built up, strengthened in the faith as we were taught. And God, I pray that this church will be overflowing with thankfulness. That we would go from overwhelmed to overflowing. It can happen in a moment, just simply in a perspective shift. That right now, God, I turn from all the needs and all the wants and uh, all the things to what you have provided. I have been transferred from a kingdom of darkness into a kingdom of light. I have been purchased freedom. God, you paid my debt off. I had a debt I could not pay. I was going to have to pay a life sentence for it. And you stepped in and paid it for me. And you forgave my sins. And you make me right with you. And so God, today, as Colossians 3 says, I let the peace of Christ rule in my heart. I know it wants to. I know you want to rule in my heart. I let it happen. As much as I know how, I get out of the way. And I thank you, Lord. God, uh, give me the strength this week to live out this action step. Uh, just to begin my day, that the first thing that I add into the world, the first thing I communicate into the world and into someone else is going to be this basic Christian attitude of gratitude. It's in Jesus' name I pray and the church said, Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We would love for you to get connected to what's going on at Rockbrook Church. Visit us online at rockbrook.org for service times, small group information, and other ways you can discover your purpose here on earth.